Good afternoon. Uh, this talk is aptly named, so tell me again why we're not refactoring, uh, or at least that's the subtitle of it. I'm keeping this as the main title. Uh, it, it falls in line with a lot of talks that I've, I've given before on, you know, let's, let's start asking questions to ourselves, to your boss, to your team, whatever position you may be in, you know, it's all right to ask these kinds of questions and, you know, encourage to ask those kinds of questions. Uh, also called Etch-a-Sketch Development. It's not as nicely named there. Uh, kind of gives it a sense of, you know, you can just clear the board whenever you want, but it's really not that thought. It's really, you can, you can build some or create some really cool things with an Etch-a-Sketch, but uh, after you see what you made and then you start going in and tweaking, you just start seeing lines across the entire board and all of a sudden you just have this black box of what used to be um, a, a really beautiful picture and then you just realize you have to kind of start over, uh, kind of refactor and, and learn from the mistakes, learn where you missed things and, and whether it's recreate or reimagine what you've built, uh, that's, that's kind of the the main concept, so uh, that's it. Thank you. No. Uh, as Vance said, my name is Jordan Rousseau. Here's contact information. Please, uh, if you have any questions or uh, any kind of um, thoughts that you may have on, on this or anything else that I put out there, uh, please, please contact me. I, I, I like to talk on the, uh, um, Twitter or, or GitHub or wherever you may be, so. Uh, there's, there's some contact information. I work at Weather Decision Technologies. It's a group of people that, from meteorologists to uh, front-end software engineers, and we build really cool stuff. Uh, hopefully in the next month or so, I'll, I'll be able to share some of the things we've been working on. It's um, kind of some stuff that we're building for international um, meteorologists um, in Indonesia. So. Uh, it's really cool stuff. Uh, follow uh, follow Weather Deck Tech, uh, and uh, you'll see some really cool stuff. So what I'm trying, what am I trying to accomplish today outside of getting uh, text messages? Uh, talk about reasons why it's okay to refactor. Uh, is it popping up over there too, or is it just on mine? Okay, good. Okay, so uh, go through some of the team's experiment, uh, some, of, some of our team's experiences with refactoring. Also, I want to lay out some ways that might help minimize the need to refactor. Okay, so what, what is this talk not about? That all code should be rewritten. Anything you write could be refactored. Sure, you, you can, but it's not that every single thing you, you touch means that you have to start over from scratch. Um, or the fact that you should look to refactor at any given time. There, there's a time and a place to do that, um, but I, I, I'm not going to really give you that, that thing. It's kind of a gray area, and so just understanding that, uh, kind of keep, keeping that eye out for times to refactor, but it's not all the time that you need to just be focusing in on that. Uh, or the fact that any minor change in an application should require refactoring. Just because you're touching it doesn't mean that you have to change it, especially if someone else wrote it. I know that sometimes code might not look as, as pleasing or as, um, as well as you like to have it look, uh, but sometimes it's just not the right time to refactor. Also, I'm not talking about some crazy node bot that will draw on an Etch-a-Sketch. Uh, I'm sorry if, if you really expected that. There's some really cool talks going on uh, across the room, so just uh, I, I won't blame you if you want to want to go away. So I ran across this tweet. Uh, it says, that, you know, this is ridiculous and broken. Who even wrote this? I try not to ask this question because most of the time the answer is myself. <laughs> and um, that really kind of is disheartening. But, but in reality, it is someone making the best of all the information <coughs> and skills they had at the time. Now, if you really think about that, you know, it's, it's never the fact that, oh, this person's a bad programmer. This person didn't do it right. They didn't, they didn't have the, the skills at the time to build out what they were trying to do. 
they, they got the job done, but it's not necessarily something that, you know, they might, they might not be proud of it now because they've probably grown as a developer. You know, the more you grow, the more you start learning on, you know, what you did wrong in the past. Okay, I have, I have a couple of ca caveats on, on this. Uh, this works, works for our team. Um, this is really kind of like a case study of, of our team. I'm, I'm kind of opening up the doors onto how we work a little bit in refactoring, and so it might not work for, for everyone. Uh, but you also may think that I'm completely wrong, and that's okay. I'm okay with that. I fully expect someone to yell out something like this, uh, and, and that's okay. Um, try not to interrupt, maybe after a slide or something like that, some dead, dead space, that's fine. You can do that. Uh, and this is not for the perfect world. At the end of the day, the team uh, has to build products. We write good code. And sometimes we write code knowing that eventually it's gonna go away sometime soon. Um, deadlines and client expectations factor in how, how we build applications. That's just, that's just how it is. It's, it's, not, it's not pretty. It might make some people cringe, but at the end of the day, we have to, we, we eventually have to deliver. Um, hey, yeah, there are some people that got that reference. Okay, cool. Uh, there was uh, one last caveat, and, and really this is for any team to succeed, um, but it's really important when talking about this kind of subject. I think a team has to have trust uh, in one another. In the, in the project that you're working on, in the company. Um, respect for one another. You know, if you're talking about code and, and quality of code, and that can be sometimes subjective, you really have to have respect of everyone around so, so we don't have the situations where uh, feelings are going to, to get stomped on. You know, you don't want to do that. You want to, you want to, have a team where you can grow people into uh, better developers. Have them appreciate the code they're writing and, and, and have a better understanding on what, what they can do better. And I think, I think respect has a lot to do with that. I think open communication is also very important. Uh, if, if the team doesn't know everything that's going on within the project, then, uh, then there's something lacking. Um, there's probably something lacking in leadership, too. Um, I, I have sometimes... Um, I'm at fault with that. Uh, but, but for the most part, you wanna have open communication with everybody on the team so they understand where, we're, where the product is going, where, where the thought process is headed. Also a voice. You can't just you know, sit on top of a perch and, and say, you know, we're, we're going to do this, this is the way we're gonna do it. It's going to radically change everything you've done over here and we're gonna to have to, you know, um, Work, work overtime to do something. It's, you know, the, a team has to have a voice. Each individual person in the team needs to have a voice to be able to express, you know, what, what they think about the project, what they think about a certain um, amount of input uh, that they, they can put in there. So um, I think this is really important for refactoring, but also just for, for any team to succeed. So, so why am I actually talking about this? <clears throat> I have feelings plenty of times uh, in a day, in a week, in years that I write bad code. Uh, and sometimes I'm a bad developer. And really saying that you want to refactor something that you've written is admission of that. Or at least that's the feeling that I have. It's not. I'm, I'll, I'll get to that later. But uh, that's, that's the kind of feeling that I get sometimes when I'm looking at my code, thinking why why am I doing this? You know, what, what, what is the point of this? This is, this is bad code or, or looking at previous code that I've written. But expectations of perfection in writing code is not reasonable. Sometimes it does brings on those feelings that uh, brings up, you know, the imposter syndrome, the, the feeling that you don't belong. And, and that's just really not something that anyone should be feeling in this, in this realm, you know, in, in this industry. We have a whole lot more stuff to worry about, whether it's, uh, a whole lot of eyes on our, our web page, or uh, making sure a database is up and running, or you know, trying to explain the fact that JavaScript is okay to write, 
Um, it's something that we, we have to worry about constantly. And, and it's, I, I, I think that we need to get away from this feeling of admission of wrong in the past is not saying that you're a bad developer. <clears throat> so why, why in fact does my code suck? Um, there's, there's a sense of perfect world that requirements are set well before uh, development starts. Third party libraries are static or at least interfaces to those libraries never change. Technologies are never modified or maybe you have one code project or a lot of people able to you know, be on a certain project so they can continually modify and care and feed in that project. Also, you know, there's tools out there that you can do of code complexity analysis and be able to really uh, pull things together and, and have this uh, really well-balanced machine of improving the product. Okay, that's a, that's a stretch goal. All right, we all know that that, that is the perfect world. And I, I, I'm not saying we should just completely forget about that, but, but it is in fact just, it, it's a stretch goal, it is. Uh, in the real world, requirements change. You get an email and, um, you know, scope of a project might change or the, the client's use case might change a bit and you're, you're struggling to, to kind of fit the, the square peg into a round hole. Third party libraries are up, updated rapidly or they're just completely abandoned or deprecated. New workflows are introduced. Dozens of projects that you might have. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I know we have uh, a lot of a lot of projects to juggle. You know, it's not a bad thing, but we we do. And sometimes uh, some of those projects aren't touched in a year, six months, or just something new comes out that's just plain better for your project. Does it really make sense to keep on building on top of a framework or a module when you know that? Something else out there is better. I think that in software development, regret is bad. Uh, to, to go on this uh, a little bit, we were about to deliver or release uh, a very large product that was built on the underlying framework was Express. And then we started to play around with Happy and, and some other support projects. We really liked the, the information it, it, it gave us. It really liked the um, flexibility it gave us, the plugins that were available to us. And we were going to release this project, product in ExpressJS, knowing full in fact that we would rather have it in, uh, you know, using HappyJS. And, and that was really kind of weird, but as soon as we released it, we started working on pulling that out and starting using HappyJS. And that was a really tough, pill to swallow, but it's something that, you know, if we're gonna build this, this product, if we're gonna be proud of this product and we wanna use the best technologies out there, in our opinion, that's, that, that we needed to do that. I, I talked last year and I, I did it, um, kind of talked about Happy, and, and so last year I actually created a demo with HappyJS uh, using version 6.9 and I actually managed to update uh, whenever I saw releases uh, new on there, and so just uh, just today actually it, it changed from uh, .3 to .4. Not not saying that version history or, or, or updating of versions really means that you're going to have to tear apart your code and do something else. Happy JS does a really good job of um, of how to make changes to your code if you're upgrading from one version to a next. But but it is something to keep in mind that you have to keep on top of these things, or in a month or two, you're going to sit around and think, well, I gotta, I gotta go through three or four different migration pieces just so I can get to the newest version of, of a framework. So you gotta start thinking on, you know, how, how, do you, how do you manage all that? You know, probably not having to refactor everything, but you, you have to stay on top of things so you're not, in the end, thinking, well, geez, is it, is it better just to kinda uh, go in there and, and do some pretty major refactoring to, to uh, get to the latest version. You know, and uh, that's, that's one example that, we, that happened with uh, our team. 
Another one was uh, in 2013, we introduced the usage of AsyncJS because uh, we just wanted to get away from the boomerang. And that was a really good uh, control flow library and it really allowed us to, to build some uh, easier followable code. And that worked out for us really well. And then we, we started looking at Bluebird uh, that is a, a promise-based library and, and we really attached to that and, and, and appreciated a lot of things that it offered. And so we're starting to use that and we started to use that probably about, I don't know, a year ago. So we had a lot of code that used AsyncJS. Now we're having to start moving that stuff over. But you know, here's, here's a question. Does the fact that using AsyncJS in 2013 mean we're bad developers because now we're using something else? Uh, and in that same line, does a team that started using AsyncJS this year mean that they're bad developers? Well, I mean, it's, it's a rhetorical question, but the, the main thing is, is that we, we really, the, the answer is no. The answer is what, what we do is it's what's best for our team and what, what anybody else does is, is good for their team. Now, it, it, it takes a while for you to understand what, what works. And it takes a while to understand what works for the team, not just an individual. And so introducing that and, and understanding what might work for one team it could be disastrous for another team. And so just the fact that you're, we're using one framework versus another doesn't mean anything really. It just means the fact that we found something that works for us. <clears throat> so in migrating the Bluebird, okay, uh, we had to change a lot of code. We did, it is a, once again, a, a really tough pill to swallow. And some projects that we have out there still uses AsyncJS. And when we add functionality to old code, we will kind of revisit that code and see if it's uh, something that we want to bring along the way. If, if there's a project coming up that's going to replace that uh, piece of code, then, then we probably won't touch it in terms of moving from one control flow to the next. But if it is something we're gonna use for a while, then we're gonna want to kind of bring it up to date with the technologies that we're using. So that's kind of how we dealt, deal with uh, whole change uh, technology switches. So that's kind of it's kind of our our what we do. So one of these things you oh geez you can't even see that. So uh, this this happened uh, uh, more than a few times and it's uh, it's a commit piece that says 61 files changed and uh, 5,300 insertions and 64 deletions. So uh, those things happen a lot when you're refactoring. It's just, it's just part, of the, part of the way you do it. So it's okay for that to happen. Just know that there's gonna be a lot of work and a lot of uh, stuff involved when making the decision to move to a different technology. And that's just, that was just control flow. Um, so it's one of those things to consider. You know, outside of making those decisions to change technologies, another thing that might happen is you just make mistakes. So uh, this, this came across and it really uh, struck a chord with me. Not sure if you're making progress, look back at your past work, see all those mistakes and things you wanna fix. Yeah, you're, you're progressing. You know, that's, that's a really, uh, that, that really hit home. Because you know, one of the best lessons in development really revolves around my review of code that I wrote two to three years ago. Um, a, a lot of the times you're just looking at it thinking, okay, you know, maybe I know what I was thinking there, but man, I could do it so much better now because, you know, hey, I'm smarter. No, it's, it's because you've just grown as a developer. You, you have so much more that you've learned along the way, and you just, you start to appreciate a lot of the things that, that, you've, that you've done from the time that you wrote that initial software to, to now. So uh, going from there, I wanna just kinda go into a couple of other quotes that, that really kind of rang true to me. Uh, and the idea that we are carving our code on stone tablets is, is toxic. To think that I'm going to write this code and it's going to exist for an X amount of time and we can't change it, that's my code. You know, you can, your, your code should be something you're proud of, absolutely. I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish that at all. And it should be beautiful. You should, you should look at it and think, man, I, I did that, that's, that's fantastic. 
and you should be proud of it. And I said that already. But at the end of the day, you can't treat it with kit gloves. You have to treat it as, as knowing that eventually something better is going to come out. Some, you're going to learn more. You're going to touch that again, and you're going to see that, well, you know what? That's, that's probably not the best way I, I, I've been able to do it. Uh, and, and in relation to that, when you start treating code as disposable, interesting things start to happen. You start, um, I really couldn't find a, uh, an animated GIF that really made sense here, so I just, treating st something as disposable. <laughs> so you, uh, you think of it as, you know, I'm writing this code. I, I don't want to sacrifice standards in, in delivering code. But I also don't want to think of it as it's something that's going to stay there forever. I think that puts a lot of pressure on the developer, on yourself, to say, this code that I'm writing has to be good because it's going to stay out there forever, and people are going to be reliant upon it for a long time. You, you, should, you should understand that, yes, people are going to be reliant on your code, but know that you can go back and make the changes if you make mistakes. You can go back and, and undo a lot of the things if, if in fact, that... It is, uh, it is a problem that you don't have those things going on. So, I mean, I think it's, it's really starting to click on our team in, in the fact that, you know, we're, we're not always thinking about, okay, how can we keep this piece of software intact while adding more pieces? No, let's, let's try to break it apart and try to understand how we can, how we can make it as best as we can possibly do it. And, and that might involve refactoring. So, so both of those quotes came from the great Devin Clark. Uh, he's one of our developers, and uh, he is, uh, he's got a lot of thoughts on this, so please go follow him. Here's his uh, Twitter address again, and a, a goofy picture of him, too. So uh, one thing I wanted to mention was, you know, you don't always want to think about refactoring. You want to keep that in your back pocket and understand that, that you can change things. You can go back on things if you really wanted to, but don't don't use it in a way of just, well, I'm just going to go try this new thing out, and so we're going to just trash this code. You know, work to make your code reusable and maintainable so you don't have to refactor. And understand if you're refactoring all the time, there's not going to be any room to improve the product. There's not going to be any way for you to really uh, innovate on, on what you're trying to do. If, if we wanted to keep on refactoring into perfection, you know, that's just something that you need to understand you're not, you're not going to do. So when refactoring and, and really developing, just keep in mind, reusability, maintainability, uh, I, I really like the um, do not repeat yourself um, um, thought process, separation of concerns, which is kind of similar, but not. And, and just know that it, it will never be perfect. So just like any end-user product, just like any uh, final product, code quality is going to oscillate to something that you're happy with. There's always like a mini, minima and maxima of, of what, you're, what you're okay with. That's your standards. But there's always that perfection line. And you're never really going to get there, but you're going to get pretty darn close. Just understand that if, if you keep on going for that perfection piece. You're going to handcuff yourself to, to not, you're, you're going to go on to uh, one side of the pendulum. And it's just, it's, you're, you're going to not be able to do the things that you want to do with the code. Eventually, you're going to ask, what was I thinking? You're going to look at, back on something, and you're going to say to yourself, seriously, like, what, what was I thinking? Why did I do it this way? And it's OK. You know, you're you're gonna get those times, and you're gonna uh, you're gonna find those bumps in the road. But it's it's all right. You're gonna you're gonna get through it. Uh, the, these kinds of things aren't aren't easy, but knowing that that you said that about past self, you can say you know I have, I've I've grown as a developer. I've, I've I've gotten better. I've I've learned from those mistakes. So. On a completely separate side of things, you know, what, what can we do to mitigate refactoring? What's, well, I, 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 in, in knowing that you can refactor and, and that's okay, we still want to be able to find ways of not necessarily uh, 
wholesale refactoring all the time. Documentation, you know, it's, it's helpful for maintainability. If someone else is, is coming along and, and being, uh, being a new developer, documentation of code bases is something that anybody can, can get onto and, and really start understanding what, what each and every function is doing, really. Uh, you're you're going to be less likely to curse your past self. Your past self might be putting in comments on, this is what I was thinking. It still might not make sense. But at the end of the day, you'll understand what this you know, piece of code is, is attempting to do. And so you're not gonna think back and think, you know, what was I thinking? This is what you were thinking. These are the comments that you have while you were writing the code base. Uh, you're also just gonna find inconsistencies and inefficiencies in the code. Uh, rubber duck debugging, which is, I don't know if anybody's heard of that. It's, you basically talk to a rubber duck and explain what the code does. And that's basically, that's documentation. If you, if you go through your code and document, you're able to explain to someone, a screen, that this is what the application is doing. And if it's not doing it, then you need to figure out what's, what's wrong with that code. And since I mentioned rubber ducking, there's, there's a duck. <laughs> it's a pretty cute duck. Many code reviews. Hopefully there's, there's code reviews uh, uh, going on around here. Uh, we, we really take heart to them, but we really don't like to do really big major code reviews. That's a, that's a drudge on everyone and it's a time sink and a lot of people will tune out after a while. So what we do is we will create feature branches of, of tiny little changes that we're doing. And before any push to or staging, we will do a code review. And so that's just tiny little pieces that will go into to staging and so you're able to have whomever is looking over the code, and we have pretty much the entire team doing that, uh, basically being responsible for the quality of code that's going out. It's not just the developer, the person that actually wrote the code, it's, it's everybody. Everybody needs to be, have, have a stake in that and it, it's really not necessarily so we can point a finger at anybody, it's more of everybody has that responsibility everybody appreciates all the changes that are going into this code. And really and truly, you're gonna miss bugs if you have too many changes in a pull request. If you have, and there's not really a certain number of lines or anything like that, but at the end of the day, you're gonna have a lot more success with code reviews if you have smaller chunks of changes. Uh, this is a, a little piece of, you know, 10 lines of code, you will find 10 issues. 500 lines of code changes, it looks fine. Right? <laughs> yes, all okay. right. Another thing that I, I like to tout that, that we're doing is microservices. You know, small applications that do one thing very well. It's very easy to pinpoint failures. You have much less time invested in each of the microservices. So if something goes wrong, if, if, if something happens to where you really do need to wholesale change something, wholesale change a microservice, it's, it's a lot less daunting than saying, we have to pull out this very large piece in this monolithic application, and we have to change that, but make sure everything else in that application doesn't change. If you have microservices, then you have interfaces into that, and you're able to make those changes knowing what interfaces are kind of reaching out. And so you're able to kind of control those changes and, and be a little bit safer in the changes you make. If that hopefully makes sense, but it, it's kind of successful with us that, that we can say, you know, okay, this, this application is, is doing poorly in performance or this application is, is bogging down the system. Let's, let's go look at that. Let's go see what's wrong with this rather than, okay, our entire application is slow. What are we gonna do? Uh, let's see here. So, you know, at the end, what, what I really want get, to get towards is going back to the why am I talking about this? And I, I kind of went on this for a while, but, you know, I, I don't want to be thinking that I write bad code. You know, I, I, I think the thought process, and at least in my head, is I, I want to write better code. I want to write better code for this project. I want to write better code uh, so, so we can have a, a better performing overall application. And not thinking necessarily that I'm a bad developer, but I'm an improved developer. 
that I've, I've grown from the time that I, I've wrote, written it before. That, that this person I'm working with is not a bad developer. That, that they've learned from what they have done in the past and are able to do a whole lot more, even notice the, the, the issues with the code that they, they, they wrote years ago. And at the end of the day, it's not necessarily wanting to refactor code admits the fact that you're a bad developer or you write bad code. It's the fact that you just want to make this application better. As a team, having that mentality of we want to change the code, we want to be able to make this application as, as good as possible is, is really the, the, the end goal that you, that you want to have. You don't want to sit around and just worry about the fact that, that this application is slow or this, this code block was written poorly. It's who wants to go out and, and make it better? Who wants to go in there and, and improve this code? And, and when you have the, the, the team mentality, when you, when you have a, a group of people that, that have that respect for each other, that have the trust within everybody, then you can really go out and, and, and do a lot of really cool things and not have to worry about, you know, oh, you're refactoring this. So that is it.